We are now two sermons away from finishing this series, and I don't know if this series on doubt has helped you. I know it has been a great benefit to your pastor as I have walked through these scriptures and been challenged and, and, and given hope. And I, I hope that you're experiencing hope and renewal. So we've got this one and then the next one. And so I, I want to encourage you to, to really lean in and to remember that doubts are a normal part of the Christian life. If you're going to live in the real world with a real faith, you're going to have to deal with your doubts. And what we've been seeking to do is to identify and overcome our doubts by studying these little books of the Bible. And our, our text today, it helps us deal with the doubts that come when we feel the pain of living in a fallen, sinful world. This morning we're going to study the book of Joel. And Joel is usually a proof text. Uh, you will very rarely find an entire sermon on the book of Joel or a series through Joel, which it could actually happen. It's not really that complicated. But typically we use it as proof text, uh, especially on Pentecost Sunday and when we're doing uh, any kind of study on eschatology, on end times. Uh, this is a, a, a typical scripture that is, that is proof text, quoted and used. The text itself is very helpful in, in overcoming and dealing with doubts and, and, uh, that come from our understanding of a broken, fallen world. Our world is broken, and we need to always remember this. I encourage you to know the three circles, not know it in terms of being able to see it and say, oh, that's three circles, but to know it so that you can share it with others and with yourself. Because when you're dealing with doubts, one of the things you got to remember is, is what, you're, what you're really dealing with is brokenness. And where does brokenness come from? It comes from sin. God created all things to be in harmony. That's God's design, and that's what you got to remember. God's design was, was wholeness, was harmony, but sin destroyed it. And so the brokenness that you and I are experiencing in the world, that, that comes from one of three places. You need to understand, one is our sin. If you are experiencing brokenness, it may very well be because you've sinned. If it's not you who have sinned, you may be experiencing brokenness because of someone else's sin. Because they've made a choice to go against the will and way of God, and the repercussions are having an impact on your life. If it's not your sin or someone else's sin, it may very well be because you and I are living in a fallen world. The Bible is not a collection of stories or sayings. The Bible is a single story in four parts. Let's say out loud those four parts. And it's very important that you get this so that you can fully understand what, 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 what Joel is all about. So there's four parts. What are they? It begins with? Then there's the? Then? And last is? That's right. We know that we live in a fallen world. Sin has created this brokenness. But God has not abandoned us. Instead, He has chosen to rescue us. And everyone who repents and believes the gospel gains freedom over the power and the punishment of sin. And we can look forward to the restoration. We can know that, that God is at work and it is His will. And we can be a people who are thriving. Thriving is having the confidence to be intimate with God and the contentment to obey God's commands while trusting outcomes to God's capable care. Friends, no matter what has happened... No matter what is happening, no matter what will happen, those who trust in Christ alone, we have the ability to thrive by seeking God in every season. God allows seasons of difficulty. God allows seasons of victory. God allows all these seasons for a reason. And when you're going through a season of doubt, a season of difficulty, it's important to thrive, and the only way you're going to be able to be a person who is thriving is by seeking God in every season. And that's what our text challenges us to do. It challenges, it encourages us to overcome doubt by seeking God, especially in seasons of doubt. If you've got your Bible, and I hope that you do, let's go now to Joel. Joel is a minor prophet. If you hit the major prophets, if you hit Isaiah and Jeremiah, Ezekiel, keep going to the right, you'll run into the little guys. And Joel is one of those early ones. Let's go to Joel chapter 2. We're going to be in verses 12 through 13. Kellen is going to come and read for us. Let's all stand together in honor of God's word. Again, we're in Joel chapter 2. And Kellen's going to read for us verses 12 through 13. Go for it. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, 
with weeping and with mourning, and rend your hearts, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Amen. Amen. Good job, Callan. If you would, go ahead and be seated and pray now for the preaching of God's word. We don't know a lot about Joel. Um, commentators, they, they disagree on when this was happening. Now, we know a sense of what was happening, but we don't know for sure when. If you've got your Bible, let's go to chapter 1 of Joel, and, and let's begin in verse 1. It says, the, Lord, the, word of the, Lord, uh, the word of the Lord came to Joel, and what he did was he preached to the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem during a time of national crisis, a, a catastrophe, the, a locust plague had come. And look what it did. Look real quick. Look at verses 5 through 7. Just take a quick, quick summation reading. Look at verse 12. And what you'll see is that the locusts had destroyed the wine. Now go to, go to verse 10, and you'll notice also that it had destroyed the wheat, which, which means it, it impacted not only their livelihood, but their worship. Look at verse 9. Look at verse 13. Look at verse 16. Because of this plague and the destruction of the wine and the grain, not only were the people's livelihoods impacted, but they could not come to God rightly and worship Him with, with, the, with the right tools. They did not have access to, to function in the, in the ways of worship which God had commanded. And so they're struggling and they're doubting. There is doldrums. There's maybe even depression. And, and as I read this chapter, chapter 1 in particular, it reminded me of our situation over the last 22 months. I mean, you think about it. For some of us, it's hard to remember what year it is. How many of you are struggling to remember what year it is? Absolutely. I was with a pastor on Thursday, and we were kind of talking about churches and things, how they've gone. And he said, you know, it was in February of, uh, was it 19? Was it? It's like, it's 2020, man. How can you forget 20? He goes, dude, I can't remember anything anymore. This is the world we live in. Things are happening so fast and yet so slow, and there's, there's turmoil. We can barely remember what year it is. But it happened for me in February of 2020 when I became aware of the, the, the thing that my wife and many others knew, is that this pandemic was going to come to the U.S. and it was going to wreak havoc on our culture. I had no idea what the ramifications would be. And in March, my wife will tell you it was one of the saddest days in her life to see me just wrecked because we decided to, to shut down the churches as all the businesses were shut down and we were told to go home. Thankfully, May came. And when May came, we began to regather for worship, began to reopen things, but things were not the same. Many did not come. Still, some are not coming. We went through this summer of tumult with the riots, racial division. Uh, politically, there has never been a, a greater time of, of, of division and pain. Meanwhile, the media is still pumping it, still producing hate, making, by the way, billions of dollars on all the turmoil uh, of, the, of the disagreements that we so easily fall into. And, and this is the world we're living in. And they keep telling us, yeah, it's, it's, kinda, it's going to normal. It's gonna, but friends, we all know different. We know things are not normal. Things have been shaken. And I know we're going to football games, and I know we're going to events, and I know we're going to activities. This pandemic is not over. A young man I've been praying for for weeks died last night in Bowling Green. This is not done. And we're living in times where there is great upheaval. People are struggling. Marriages, families, communities are faltering like, like, like we've never seen. There's guys that have been in the ministry 40, some 50 years are saying we've never seen marriages and families and communities crippled like they are right now. Knees wobbling, faltering. Fewer people are gathering for in-person worship. Doubt is spreading. And friends, we've got to fight against it. And the first step in fighting against it is recognizing that it's here. Recognizing that it's real. Mark Waltz published a report recently with this statistic. 70% of our population is or has experienced trauma. The trauma from COVID-19 is real. And for many more, this season of feeling alone, uncertain, anxious, depressed, has raised trauma from other causes. Our own mental health has been, has been unattended because we believe as things get back to quote-unquote 
normal, this will all resolve itself. Nothing could be further from the truth. Friends, we need to deal with the doubt that comes from traumatic times. We need to lean in and understand God's will and God's way. That's what thriving people do. And the way we do that is by choosing to seek God in every season. There's four things I would encourage you to remember and and therefore write down. First thing, in seasons of doubt, thriving people keep seeking God to gain a true view of reality. A true view of reality. So when you take just a quick glance of Joel chapter 1, verse 1, and go all the way to chapter 2, verse 11, what you're seeing there in your text there is a, is a general description of what was happening that everyone seemed to know but not realize. Th- there's a difference. There's something that we can say, yes, I know that, I know that, but do we realize it? Is it our reality? Because apparently, even though all these things were happening, the Lord felt compelled to say, this is happening. You're, you're going through something, but you don't seem to see it. You, you've got your eyes open, but you're blind. Do you, do you not see what's going on? Are you not aware? And apparently they were not because God went to great pains to communicate that they were not fine. There is, there is something terrifying to see someone who says they're fine when they're not fine. One of our paramedics was telling me uh, recently about a young man who had run into a woman and, and she had died immediately in the accident and and he crawled out of the front windshield of his car covered in blood and they were trying to get him to settle down and he just kept saying I'm fine I'm fine I'm fine I've just got to go and was trying to find something to do they, they had to they had to still him and get him just brother sit still you know I, I love history and one of the movies I, I love to hate to watch is Saving Private Ryan in that opening scene where, where there's a man carrying his own arm that had been shot off who's, who's thinking, I'm fine, I'm fine. I've just got to keep going forward. I, I'm fine. In this room, there are people living in shock. You've lost semesters of school, seasons of life, loved one, jobs, maybe your dreams. And you're saying, I, I'm fine. I, I'm fine. It's, it's okay. It, it's, it's we're getting back to normal. And the reality is, is that we're, we're not fine. We are living in, aren't you so sick of hearing this phrase, in unprecedented times? Who is sick of hearing the phrase, unprecedented times? Yes. Well, they've said it so much, and even though it's true, we've become numb to the reality. We know that there are unprecedented times, but do we realize it? Are we living in reality? We need to take heed. Go to, go to Joel chapter 1, verse 2. We need to take heed of what God said to those people in Joel's day. Hear this, you elders. Give ear, all inhabitants of the land. Has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it. Let your children tell their children and their children to another generation. Friends, we're living in times that have not existed in current lifespans. We're living in times that we will tell our children and their children, their children, and their children, their children. And these days, we, we need to look to God And we've got to get a sense of reality. We've got to remember, this world is not as it should be. But God has not abandoned us, and God has not given up. We've got to realize that our God is in control. He is working out a plan. And the only way we, the only way we can thrive is by seeking the Lord with all of our heart and trusting in His will and in His way. God is faithful. The victory is sure. To enjoy it, we've got to, more, we've got to do more than have a cognizant capacity to, to, to understand it. We must realize it. It must be real to us. What, what does it mean to realize it? What does it mean to be real? It means that we hold to what God's Word says rather than what the world is telling us, rather than what our feelings are pressing on us. Let me give you a little of the reality. Deuteronomy chapter 10. Here's reality. What does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all His ways, to love Him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord, which I am commanding you today for your good. Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the heaven of heavens, the earth with all that is in it. Yet the Lord set His heart and love on your fathers and chose their offspring after them, 
You above all peoples, as you are this day. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who is not partial and takes no bribe. You shall fear the Lord your God. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. And by his name, you shall swear. He is your praise. He is your God. That's reality. But is it your reality? You know what those words mean, some of them, most of them. You understand the concept. You've heard them quoted in other ways in other portions of Scripture. You have a sense of what that means, but is it real? Is it real or are you deceived? Have you allowed the world and all that it is saying to drive out truth? Have you ever wondered why it is they don't want our children reading the Bible in, in school? Have you ever wondered why, when people begin to pontificate, they love to say that people of faith have no place in the public arena of discussion, that we should not bring our faith, that we should not bring our biblical ideas or ideals to the table. They should be left private. Why is that? Why are they so afraid of the Bible? Let me tell you why, because it's dangerous. The Bible is dangerous. And what it is in danger of doing is waking up a people to reality. I'm praying today some of you will wake up. I'm praying that I will wake up to understand that there is a d evil, there is a darkness, there is a deception, and it is driving us away from the very fundamental truth read there today from Deuteronomy chapter 10. Friends, there's a difference between saying, I know this information and realizing it and it being your reality. Seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and, and gain a true view of reality. Secondly, in seasons of doubt. Thriving people keep seeking God to own our sin and respond with repentance. The pain the people felt in Judah's day, in Joel's day rather, was because of their sin. The worst pain of our day is certainly because of sin. You know, given all that is going on in, in our world, it makes sense that we would do what God commanded the people of of Judah to do in Joel's day. Look at, look at chapter 2, our, our, our public reading, verse 12. Through verse 13, look at, what, look what they were commanded to do and what we're commanded to do. First, return. Look what he says in verse 12. Return to me. To return to him, first of all, you have to realize that you're not with him, that you've wandered off, that you've gotten away from God. Return to the Lord. Return to him by faith. Return to him under his authority. But look how we are to return. Do so with all your heart. Not just out of habit. Oh, yeah, I guess we've got to go to church. We always go to church. Let's go to church. Not, not because, oh, I know, we, I know I need to read. I know I need to study. I know, I know I need to pray. No, no, no. With all your heart. God, I must meet with you. God, I must praise your name. You are worthy. You are great and gracious. And I delight myself in you. There's a difference. Returning to the Lord with all your heart. And urgently, how, how, how does the urgency look? Look at verse 13. With fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, rend your hearts, not your garments. In other words, don't just, don't just grab your, oh, it's so hard. I, I, forget that. Rend your heart and say, God, move. I need you now. I need you more than I need food. So I'm not going to take food. I'm just going to drink water for health. And I'm going to say, God, help me. This is urgent. When was the last time you honestly felt that way? Where you were so wrapped up in the greatness of the glory of God that you said, Lord, I must have you. I must have you work. I must experience you. I must see you. I must have this reality. You can only do that believing God is, look at verse 13, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He relents over disaster. Friends, please understand, if we repent, it's because the Spirit of God allows us to. By awakening us to the reality of what's really going on, it is not natural to return to God. It is supernatural. And it should create within us a humility and a gratitude, unlike anything else can. More than that, we believe that, that, that God is worthy of our, of our faithfulness, of our faith, because we believe that He is good, He is gracious, He is right. Again, there's one thing to say, oh yes, God is right, God is good, let Him thank Him for it. There's another thing to say, no Lord, 
It's not what I feel. It's not even what, I, what the world's telling me. It's not what we, it's what you say because you're God. And because you're right and you're good, even though it doesn't make sense to me, I'm going to do it because I trust you. Friends, that's faith. Faith, faith is what you do when it doesn't make sense. Faith is what you do when, when, when it's like everyone's going, really? Yeah, really. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to walk with God. I'm going to obey God. I'm going to go against the, 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 the flow of culture. I'm going to go against my flesh. We trust God and we seek to be wise and we seek to be blessed. Now to do that, you know what it requires? Humility. It requires that we say, God, I don't have it all figured out. And the human race doesn't have a fix. And things are not going to get better on our own. Things are just going to get worse. And in and, and that humble place to say, and Lord, I seek you. You are my hope. You alone are not a theoretical Savior, a functional Savior. The true source of my identity and my hope and my life. Another, in seasons of doubt. In seasons of doubt, thriving people keep seeking God to hope in God's promised renewal. Now, this is the portion that is most widely quoted in the New Testament. This is the one that, that we often see. When we repent and believe, God gives us a renewal. It's a new life. Uh, John 3 says that we are born again. I love 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Sin robs us of life. Sin kills us. But Christ gives us life. God, God, through his grace, makes our relationships right. Here's what happens. When you're right with God, you get peace with God, you get peace within. When you've got peace with God and peace within, you can make peace with other people. And that gives you confidence. It gives you the confidence to know I'm not always right and everybody else isn't always right, but God's always right. And God has forgiven me. I forgive me. And because I've forgiven me, I forgive you. And because God has forgiven me, I am compelled to forgive you. That's peace. That's the power of God. And this is the life that the Spirit of God brings. It's a life filled with hopes and aspirations. Those who are made new in Christ we gain these blessings, 18 through 19. When you look at Joel 2, 18 through 19, again, just peruse that. Here's what you'll read. You'll read of the care of God, the provision and protection of God to accomplish His plan, and the kindness of God. Now, who gets that? Who receives that? Who realizes that? Only those, only those who are partakers of the Spirit of God. Go to verse 28. Again, here's the real famous passage. It's often quoted, is quoted in the New Testament. Joel 2, 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. And this is exactly what Jesus promised. John, John chapter 16, verse 13 when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Jesus said, what Joel said, going to happen. It's about to happen. The spirit of God is going to come. He's going to bring truth. He's going to bring life. He's not going to just bring anything. He's going to bring God himself. The Holy Spirit did come. Pentecost Sunday. Acts chapter 2 records the event, beginning in verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Verse 14. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. This is the promise Joel made. This is the promise that Jesus affirmed. We who are born again, we now are made alive by the Spirit. We're filled with the Spirit. We're empowered by the Spirit. We're sealed in, in the Spirit until the day of judgment. This is the gift of God. This is the power of God. It's found in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And He changes everything. A person 
A person without the Holy Spirit is like a person with a car with no fuel. I love cars. Cars are great. It's amazing what cars can do now. Cars can talk. Cars, cars have all kinds of blinky, shiny. They show movies now. It's, it's just all, apparently they can drive themselves, but let's all agree we're not going to do that, okay? It's too much. It's too far. But, but here's the thing. If a, if a car doesn't have fuel, you know what the owner has to do? He has to, or she has to push it. And that, that's exhausting. I mean, just for laughs today when you leave church. Don't, don't use fuel. Just push it. And what I will tell you is for some of you, that's exactly what you're doing with your real life now. You're trying to push yourself. You're trying to make it happen. It's all in your power. It's all in what you can do. And no wonder you're exhausted. No wonder your marriage is so challenged. Your family is so hard. Your life is so difficult because you're doing it wrong. You're not made to push your life. You're made to be empowered by the Spirit of God. You're made to, yes, you don't go autopilot. Yes, when you drive a car, yes, there's something in your glove box, probably, that tells you how to operate it. It's, a, it's an owner's manual. God has given us the owner's manual. It's not that you can do whatever you want. It's you do what the Creator made you to do, but you do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. As the Spirit of God is alive in you, that is the power that enables you to obey, the power that enables you to seek, the power that enables, enables you to understand the Word of God and to walk in the way of, of, of Christ. Friends, it's not willpower, it's God's power. How many of you claim to be Christians, but you are not living in God's power? You're living in your power and what you can manipulate, and what you can conjure up, and what you can convince and connive and come up with, and what you can do. Friends, that is no way to live. It makes no more sense than you going out and pushing your car home today. What makes sense is to live in the Spirit. And when you're living in the Spirit, and you can only live in the Spirit if you've repented and believed the gospel. So we're, again, the three circles, what you've got to remember. That, that once you understand where brokenness comes from, your sin, you repent of it. You turn away from sin. You believe the gospel, the good news of what God has done in Christ Jesus. And, and having been made alive by the Spirit of God, now you can pursue and recover God's design. But not in your power, in the power of God. And that power reminds you and pushes you forward and compels you with the hope of the restoration. And that's the last thing to catch. In seasons of doubt, thriving people keep seeking God to rest in God's plan for restoration. Now, there's some of your scriptures, if you'll notice, after verse 29, they, they, there's not a, there is a break, but there's not, there's not a title break. When I read this, I see in verse 30 a whole new description of reality. I see something different being talked about. And, and to me, what I see is the restoration God has been promising for millennia that he is going to make all things new, that he's going to destroy the current world as we know it, and he's going to bring about a new heaven and a new earth. This restoration of God is known throughout the Bible as the day of the Lord, or just as the day. And this promise of this restoration was not only spoken of by Joel, but also by Jesus. John chapter 14, I use this at funerals. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. Look what Joel prom, uh, prophesied that God would do. Look at verse 30. The prophecy says that God would show wonders in the heavens and on the earth. Now I want you to look very closely. Look at these metaphors. Look at these, look at these words. Blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord. Friends, this is going to be a terrifying day when creation is undone. More than that, look at verse 2 of chapter 3. 
gather all the nations. What, what God promised is that he would gather all the nations and I will enter into judgment with them. There's going to be a great judgment. Revelation reiterates all of this. Now, again, look real quick. Go back to verse 30 and 31 of chapter 2. Look at the metaphors. Look at the phrase. Look at the phrases. Now listen to Revelation 6, beginning in verse 12. It's a long section. Listen. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne. And look at this strange phrase, and from the wrath of the lamb. What a mixed metaphor that is. The wrath of the lamb. I mean, that, most of us don't say, what are you going to be for Halloween? A lamb because it's so wrathful. No, no, it's a mixed matter. What's happening here? Obviously, they're talking about the wrath of Jesus Christ. The one who came to save is coming again in wrath. Look at verse 17. For the great day of the wrath has come. And who can stand? Friends, when all the judgments are done, there will be a restoration. It'll be glorious. Revelation 21. Again, lean into this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. He also said, Write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. What happens to us on the day of restoration is determined entirely by what is our functional Savior. All created things will be destroyed. If you are relying on your looks, your job, other people, popularity, power, if you're relying on any created thing to define yourself, to give yourself meaning, to give yourself purpose, to give yourself hope, you are lost because all the things that you're counting on will be lost. There's only one that saves. Go to Joel 2.32. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. What is your functional Savior? Is it Christ alone? If it is not Christ alone, then what you are relying on is leading to your downfall. Even if it's a good thing, it won't last. It can't redeem you. It will not make it through the restoration. Only what is eternal. Everyone here, listen, every one of us is trusting in something. What or who is your functional Savior? Friends, if it is not Jesus, repent and believe the gospel. And I know some of you have heard these words many times. 
I want to read a warning to you from Hebrews chapter 3. There's a purposeful repetition that I hope will strike fear in your heart. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness. As I swore my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. They shall not enter heaven. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. Be careful that you are not claiming Christ as your theoretical Savior alone. Make sure that Christ is your functional Savior. He is your Lord. He is your life. He is your purpose. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, look at the repetition. Today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Friends, do not turn away from God. Seek the Lord. If you will draw near to Him, He will draw near to you. Seek the Lord and overcome your doubts in any and every season. Let's pray. Let's all stand together as we pray. And and if I could get our care leaders to come forward to care for the body. Father God, I am so grateful for this word. And I pray, Lord, that you are opening eyes that we can see and ears that we can hear and that we can do more than understand that we can honestly realize that this, that this reality of salvation in Christ alone is all that we have and all that we need. Lord, I pray for some who are here right now that they would be saved. If you need to be saved right there with your head bowed, your eyes closed, right now, tell God that you've sinned. He already knows. Tell Him that you've sinned. Tell them that you believe that Christ died for your sin and that you need forgiveness and that you want Him to take over your whole life. That He's going to define you. He's going to be your hope and your dreams, your aspirations and your longings. Father, I pray right now that there are many who will be saved today that are being saved even now. And that they will come and talk with these leaders so they can help them in the next steps. And Father, I pray for your people. Some who honestly do not have Christ as their functional Savior. And and friends, right there where you are, I know we talked about this during the, the Lord's Supper. But maybe God's word has spoken something fresh. Do you need to repent of an idol? Do you need to repent of something that you're trusting in other than Christ? give you meaning and hope and life and love and identity repent repent of that idol do not harden your hearts do not trust in sin trust in Christ and obey his word commit yourself to him now oh God it is a supernatural thing to trust in you it is not natural Holy Spirit, enable belief. Enable us to live in this reality, to seek you, God, and to overcome doubt. We thank you for this blessing. And we ask, God, that you would help us. Some need to come and pray at this altar. Lord, hear them as they pray. Some need to come and talk to spiritual leaders about circumstances and situations, maybe a need in their heart, their soul. God, give them the courage to do that. God, bless us, not not because we are worthy, but because we come in the one who is worthy, Jesus Christ, our mediator, our king, our high priest, and our love and our Lord. We need you, Lord. Bless us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.